Good evening, everybody. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Doing marvelous, marvelous. How you doing, John? I am doing good, man. It's so good to see so many familiar faces here joining us for our Tuesday night huddle. And I see all my friends over at Casa Grande. Hey, guys, how you doing? Man, I am so glad you guys are able to, to, to join us tonight. We're going to have a very exciting night as I uh, welcome and introduce my dear friend, Pastor Paula White, uh, joining us tonight all the way from Florida. Before we get started in that, uh, I know that Art has some, um, some housekeeping things. So Art, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, Green, are you there? Oh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the huddle. Uh, uh, for tonight's huddle, uh, if everyone, if you guys have any um, questions, please post it. You have a question in the comments, and we will try to get to everyone. Uh, if you guys could also make sure that uh, you keep your phone on mute whenever you're not speaking. Uh, that way we don't get any feedback or distortion or pick up any conversations not meant for the group. Thank you, guys. All right, all right, all right. So why don't we start off with uh, anybody here for the first time, new people here today? And if you uh, could just signal to Art in the chat room. I know that uh, Paula Lawrence is uh, in the chat room sending some messages. But anybody here for the first time? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Why don't you take a, you know, just a few seconds, eight seconds, six seconds, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jason. Uh, just started the program. I'm really excited to see where I go with it. All right. Well, Jason, welcome, man. You had a, well, did you enjoy yourself last week when we were going through the training? Oh, yeah. Very much so. Very, very much so. Good deal. Good deal. I think one of the benefits of, uh, of seeing people going through that process, you know, those of us working with you, when we uh, see the, 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 the glow that's coming from you, it's kind of, uh, kind of like us watching the evolution of life, man. So we're looking very forward to working with you. Man, I see the Campbells have joined us tonight. Hey, guys, how you doing? Is that Layla in the back there? Hi, Layla. <laughs> Is she teaching mom and dad how to work the, uh, the Zoom call? Uh, yes, yeah. she just taught us. <laughs> All right. It's good to see you guys out here tonight. Uh, anybody else new for here for the first time? I'll give you a few minutes to respond. What about testimony? Somebody who has uh, has seen something miraculous in their life will take a few minutes for that. Well, this is my first time on the Zoom, so yeah, I follow you on Facebook. All right. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I am doing good. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Tuesday night huddle. Uh, this is our Tuesday night huddle that we do every uh, Tuesday night where we just get some, uh, some of our alumni graduates, uh, people who graduated, you know, not too long ago to some of you uh, that I see right now uh, have been with the, uh, with the Hope for Prisoners organization for, you know, eight, nine, ten years. So thank you guys so very much for that. Right. Anybody else before we take a deep dive into it and get started? So, Hello. First time. Yes. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Georgette, and um, this is my first time here. And I first became aware of you, and I read a, I read the uh, article, the editorial in the New York Times. Okay. Well, yes. Awesome. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So I'm just very interested in what you're doing and want to know more about it. Well, good deal, Georgette. We're going to make sure that that young lady down in the left-hand corner over there, Paula Lawrence, she's going to send you a private message and let you know how you might be able to get involved. Thank you so much. I got an email from you today, right? Yes. Yes. Here's my problem. Here's my problem. I'm on the East Coast. Okay. And I was look I was looking for you at six PM, you know, and of course the time difference and I was all right. up. So anyway, right. I got it now. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us all the way from the East Coast. I know our dear friend Paula White is joining us on the East Coast too. And we're looking very forward to introducing her. Anybody else, any other questions here for the first time? Testimonies that you like to share, anything that you've seen that God do in your life? Uh, over the you know the last week last month something that you've been praying for that you got answered please make sure you uh use this opportunity to uh to share it with us hi john it's donna donna Blizniak. hey donna how you doing guess what i guess i, I, 
I know you did. Give Donna a gigantic hand. Well, good deal. A year and a half. Um, I start uh, started on Monday at AA Towing. Okay. Uh, doing dispatching and billing, and I'm so happy and thankful and grateful to you guys. So thanks a lot. No, we're so very thankful for you. And guys, if you guys look up persistent, the definition of persistence or tenacious that's in the dictionary, Donna's face would be right there because she was just very persistent, didn't give up, right? <laughs> just kept fighting through, yep, right? And, and you know that anytime, you know, if people keep saying no, 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 you keep holding on until you hear that, yes. Exactly. So thank you. So very proud of you. Good thank job. You, thank you. All right. Any, any others before we take a... Hey, John, Mark, Mark Lefkowitz here, and I'm so uh, pleased and honored to be on. And one of the participants reached out to me. I've led the huddle a few times. Uh -huh. and I did some one-on-one -on -one, uh, with Tony, and it was really my honor to do that. So thank you for having me here. Mark, it is so uh, such so honorable that you uh, do that. Thank you so very much. And and I know that, the, that the, when you came out to do the huddle, you did such a phenomenal job. And we want to keep you on that short list to make sure that we uh, get you back here soon. Anyone else? All right, so why don't we do this, right? I am so very excited to introduce you to our speaker that we have joining us here tonight. Um, and it's just an honor and a privilege for her to be here. I know many of you know her, but just in case any of you, you know, lived on the rock for a long time, I'm gonna read her bio and then I'm gonna introduce her and, uh, and, and let her loose on you. So uh, Pastor Paula White is the president of Paula White Ministries, headquarters in Apoca, Florida, and she's a spiritual advisor for President Donald Trump. She holds Paula today and is a renowned life coach, best-selling author, and highly sought after motivational speaker. Uh, Paula's commitment to humanity is felt worldwide as she reaches out through numerous charities and compassionate ministries, fulfilling her mission and her call to transform lives, heal hearts, and win souls. She also uh, as oversight, is oversight pastor of City of Destiny, located in Florida, right outside Orlando. It is my honor and a privilege to introduce you to my dear friend, Pastor Paula White. Get a hit your mute button. You're on mute. There we go. There we, there we are. Hey, Hi. Pastor Paula. Hey, John, I am so happy to be with you. So excited to be with everyone and just welcome. And see, uh, John told me I have about 20 minutes, but I've got like uh, 67 pages of preaching. So I hope you'll have the next like five hours when we spend together. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Just messing. Um, in case you don't know, um, let me go back because I really think it's hard to appreciate someone's what they say their glory or you know you read resumes if you really don't know their story and really don't understand um, where they've come and how they've come, what they've come through. And I remember when John and I met, um, how touched I was. I just felt a real connection. I was like, that's my brother, and I understood. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in Tupelo, Mississippi. I didn't grow up in church at all. Um, I came out of a, my, my family was pretty educated and well-to-do. My, my father committed suicide when I was five years old and that rocked our world. Uh, my grandmother cut us off and so we went into extreme poverty. I, I didn't really recognize at the time that I was living like in a section eight housing or you know that we were poor or fighting with my brother we do a lot of feeding programs and I talk about how that's so important to me to take care of the poor to feed the hungry to clothe the naked and to visit those who are in prison and much of that comes through my own struggles and hurt as well as also through my biblical belief of why I do what I do and um, but I remember what that was too I was with the Ivanka we were in Pittsburgh at a church doing this farmers to family and she never really heard my story, though I knew them 19 years. And I said, I, you know, remember what it was going to bed hungry for three nights, four nights, and then fighting with my brother over a bowl of noodles that they put ketchup on and called spaghetti. Um, I was sexually and physically abused um, for years and years of my life. That created a lot of uh, faulty beliefs and all behavior come out of belief. So I'll give you one example. When I was um, about 
I don't know, six years old or so, right after my father died. My brother was about, he's a half brother, but I wouldn't find that out for many years later. Um, and he was all cuddled up next to my mom. And I tried to go over and, you know, get some loving there and some affection. And my mom had become a raging alcoholic. And, and I say that um, because she was just dealing with her own demons. She was trying to figure out life herself and, um, you know, had a lot of shame, had a lot of guilt. No Jesus, no God, no understanding or concept of that whatsoever. And my mom said, God, why'd you give me, I don't even know why she said God, because we never, I mean, it was like the tooth fairy to me at the time, John, I never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she said, God, why'd you give me such a beautiful little boy and such an ugly little girl? Now, mm -hmm. point of that is I'm 54 years old now. And if any of y'all have some ugly children, there's hope for them. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so so, but at the time I was on a bottle until I was about five years old, teeth rotted out, uh, wetting my pants, you know, I remember first grade, Miss Sheely, my, and I tell these stories because, you know, our, our background really forms us a lot, a lot. And um, in first grade is going, my father just committed suicide, sexually and physically abused, poverty, um, everything absolutely aligned against me. Prognosis said, this is how your life is going to turn out. So prognosis had one thing for me, but purpose had another thing for me, which mm. I'll get to in just a moment. And, um, you know, I, I wet my pants and back then they still could, you know, beat you in school. And, and so she stood me in the corner all day and, you know, spanked me in front of everyone and just shamed me even further. So I took on this faulty belief. I believed that I was bad. I believed that I was um, not valuable. When someone takes their life, um, it's more than just rejection because rejection is I deny you. Uh, but when you're abandoned in life, which many of us have been uh, by people, you fundamentally believe you're flawed in life. And in, in, in all humans, God made us in his image to want the, to, you know, we, we all come from different backgrounds. We have different experiences, but fundamentally we're more, similar than we are different. And what I mean by that is everyone wants to be safe. Everyone wants to be loved. Everyone wants to be valued and everybody wants to be validated. And so I didn't have those things or no formation of them. I did life from the time I was five years old on my own, pretty much never sat down to family meal in my life. Um, you know, I learned how to put cheese on a piece of toast and I don't know. I mean, that was, that was dinner. And so when I, I suffered with, um, I, I just would do anything to get love, whether that was being an overachiever, whether that was being trying to be a straight A student, whether that was having sex with you. Um, you know, I, I wanted love. I, I had that empty hole in my heart. And so long story short, I get pregnant out of wedlock when I was 18 years old. I was living on Bill Moxley Road. See, all this one in that resume that John just read. <laughs> Bill Moxley Road in a trailer and they called me trailer trash. I was on WIC and um, you know, I, life, like I said, didn't have the greatest prognosis for me. And um, so it would said everyone in my family, my dad, my great grandfather, two uncles had committed suicide. My grandmother died pretty much strung out on volume. Um, mother's a raging alcoholic. I had a lot of guys that we had to call uncle. So prognosis for me said that I would have a lot of mental health care problems, behavior problems. I mean, I think we already know what prognosis is going to say. But when I was 18 years old, I had a real supernatural divine encounter. Mm -hmm. Now, my story always has a guy in it, so don't get mad at me, but it ends up with the right two guys, all right, with Jesus and John. I'm married to Jonathan Cain, who plays uh, in Journey. He wrote all those iconic songs, Don't Stop Believing, Faithfully. He'll come say hi to you, you know, stuff like that. And um, all, all those, I mean, 200 and something hits, which is a miracle in itself because I never thought I'd have real stability in my life because there was no stability. Um, what happened when I was 18, I was chasing this guy and I went to his grandmother's house and his uncle was there and he looked me in my eyes and said, I've got the answers to your questions and the solution to your pain and problems. And of course, I was real defensive, like, what are you talking about? And I just, I was going to cover all my nakedness, just like Adam and Eve, you know, when mm. they were in the garden and they walked, they, first thing they started doing is putting on fig leaves, like they could hide from God. Now, I never really had an understanding of God. 
and he grabs out this Bible. It was about as big as this one. And he gets this big old Bible and he tells me all this stuff. Like first off, he tells me things I don't like hearing. Like I'm a sinner. I'm like, I'm a what? <laughs> and he tells me I'm a sinner and, and how I'm going to go to hell and, and all this stuff that honestly I'm getting pretty upset about. But at the same time, his words were piercing with love that I thought mm. that, that truth was piercing through all the nonsense and the the junk I'd been fed in life. And I, all I can say, this sounds really corny, but I walked outside and for the first time in my life, the grass was green and the sky was blue. And I can't say that my life um, got a lot in here right after that. And this is where I wanna help you with tonight and maybe be able to huddle together and share some of the things that 36 years later have brought me what some people call success, but my, my real success is my walk with God. You know, and God's taking me on this world journey and, and, and in some amazing places that we can open up and talk about. But he told me to go find a church. I was 18 years old. I was still living in the I, I didn't know, you know, like I'm shacking up. I don't know that's technically like sin. But all of a sudden I go in and I'm like, I can't do this. And he goes, do what? And I said, I don't know this. And he goes, what? And I'm like, I don't know. I can't do this. And I didn't even know what conviction was. I had no idea. I had no Christianese, no terminology, no backdrop whatsoever. I just knew that for the first time in my life, I felt real love. Now, it would take me a long time for behavioral changes. I would make a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, I still make mistakes, but I'm getting better every day because God has made me great every day. I can tell you a good man falls down seven times or a good woman, but you keep getting back up and I don't care what people say about you. Once you surrender your life to God, God's purpose will prevail over all man's plans. So even now, you know, against all uh, stats, as they say, prognosis, you know, everything else, um, God just keeps saying, let me show off because this girl loves me. And that's mm -hmm. more of who I really am. So he told me to find this church. And I went to a couple churches. I was 18 years old. Everybody was pretty old, you know, 60 or so. Now that's young now, but um, back then. That was <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I need that book. I need that book. And this is what changed my life and what I pray will change your life. I got a Bible. It wasn't quite this big, um, but I got me on myself a Bible and I held it up and I didn't even know I was praying revelation, but I, I just prayed. I said, God, show me who you are show me who I am and show me what life is about. And what I did know was I was sick and tired of being sick and tired that I didn't want to keep making massive uh, mistakes and keep getting in the same cycle, what we call generational curses, because I came out of complete generational curses. I didn't know how to do it. I would um, fail my way into a lot of successes in life. Um, I've been married too many times. I mean, just be honest about my testimony and stuff. I, I don't have this perfect life. I'm not the preacher that's going to get up and say to you, you know, I've pastored the second. I'll, I'll skip up now. They'll talk about me being the pastor to the president or being the first female clergy to do the inauguration. Or I, I built the second largest church in the nation. I have had, uh, I started a ministry called Paul White Ministry that reaches in 5 billion homes and Honestly, I, I cannot tell you that I'm qualified, that I knew everything. All I know is that I seek God on everything and he'll download heavenly strategies to mm. you and he will give you a wisdom that is far above what any person can do. And I promise you that the plans of man will fail and the plans of God will prevail. And the days that you want to give up and listen, I've done crazy, stupid, I mean, ridiculous things. Here we are. We start a church and, um, and I could keep going about how I started ministry. I'll, I'll give you that. Do you want me to kind of give you the backdrop there? How many oh, please do. So I start getting in the word. I do nothing for two years of my life, but really stay in the word. And the more I'm in the word, the more I'm growing and, and really beginning to understand. I live in Maryland outside of Washington, D.C. I'm living in this trailer. Somebody comes and gives me a turkey because I, I have no food. I mean, we're, we're dirt poor. And I'm wondering, how am I going to feed my baby? I've got this little baby, these beautiful brown eyes staring at me, you know, and, and um, basically... Um, but, but I'll tell you what, I had some nice curtains on my trailer. So I will say that I, I decked it out, <laughs> but, but, um, the, the short and long story and any of you that have ever gone through struggles know, like sometimes we do things in life 
not because we're bad people or not because, you know, I, I separate who we are because I was lied to about who I was. And until you know, and what I mean by that is life lied to me and Satan certainly used people to lie to me, to falsely form me. Because until you know your identity, the essence of who you really are, you'll never fulfill mm. your destiny. And that's important because who you really are is at the core of you. You are a spirit that is in a body that has a soul. And that soul is our biggest struggle, that mind, will, and emotions, which Romans 12, 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed yes. by the renewing of your mind. And that means yes. renovation, taking out the old and putting in the new. So most of my 36 years of serving God and being in ministry has been taking out the old, the lies. I would still struggle with those. That's why I would pick the wrong guys. You know, I kept seem, seeming to get the same uh, you know, package in a different gift wrapping. I would pick uh, abusive relationships or um, people that didn't value me and validate me. And it was, it was interesting because some parts of my life seemed so successful and some were utterly failures. And um, the only thing that I know how to say that, that brings true satisfaction is understand how to truly be discipled. And, and go make disciples means to go make pupils, go make learners. And I became a learner of God. I became a learner because really, honestly, I just didn't want to live in the sixth cycle that I'd been in. So the more I got to know God, this person came and brought me this turkey. And I just looked up, I'm like, okay, man, I felt so blessed. I thought I was like, it was like I'd hit the lotto. I had a whole turkey that day. And I took half of it, cut it for me and my son. And I said, I've got to take the rest of this and go do something. So I took it down. I got on the BART, um, went down to Washington, D.C. This is 1984. It was the murder capital of the world. There was, a, a, there was an advocate by the name of Mitch Schneider, who was an advocate for the homeless and um, an advocate for those that were poor and just in extreme distress and vulnerable uh, communities. I went to Anacondia. And so I started working in the inner city in the hood in Washington, D.C. because somebody put a turkey in my hand and I took half of it and started feeding. Mm. And drug lords were back in that day. So I started a children's program that started ministering into the inner city of Washington, D.C. And these drug lords, kids started getting saved. And this was, you know, D.C. was a little different. And then um, one thing led to another. God said, go to Tampa, Florida. I'd married this man by the name of Randy at the time. And we went to Tampa, Florida. They gouged a man because the, uh, this is 1991. They gouged a man because the color of his skin and it was Ponce de Leon, North Boulevard in Tampa, Florida. And God said, go in there. And I went into what was a very heavily um, radical, radical, not when I say, because I believe, you know, in religious liberties and freedom of all faiths, but this was a very heavily radical Muslim um, population. I was a white woman that's been formed by black culture that was in a very tough situation. And I I'm stuck. First things, guns helped in my head, hypodermic needle, stuck with it. And I just shut my eyes and kept preaching the gospel. So this mm -hmm. is how ministry started for me. And I kept feeding people. We would go to Intamin Bakery and get the leftover and I'd feed them. And so they'd say, hey, you know, she's no good. She's not this. But they said, but she knows our kids' names. She cares. Because I'll tell you one thing, you can't legislate love. You can't fake love. Because God is love. And when you have a real relationship with God, that love flows in you and starts flowing through you. Doesn't yeah. mean everything was perfect in my life. It was far from it. But that's how ministry started for me. Uh, five people started calling us pastor. So we started a church with five people and it became uh, the second largest church in the nation with 250 outreaches. Um, much of that being prison ministry and um, things that just meant so much to my heart. Um, helping with children that had been displaced, broken, abused, battered, because um, that was so much of my life. And God had brought a lot of restoration. When I say that, it doesn't mean like nothing went wrong. I wrote a book called Something Greater about my life. Um, it was the hardest thing I'd ever done uh, because it, it, there were many things. I mean, many areas where um, they wrote about me in Tulane uh, University. They were doing a societal, economic, how religion still impacts America. And they said, who are the five most influential? And surprisingly, they put me in there, John. And I thought, like, mm -hmm. why am I influential? And they said, she's kind of the Oprah of Christianity. I'm mm -hmm. reading 
spoke about myself thinking this is kind of crazy and weird. And they said, well, she's muddy authenticity. And I thought, okay, that fits. And they followed me around for 10 years and just examining my life, which is a weird thing. And um, I said, that's true. I have mud on me, a lot of mud. Some of it I threw on myself. Some of it, I just fell down and wallowed in it. And some of it got thrown on me. But you know what I found out? Like God is the master cleaner of mud. God is the master transformer of lives. And I'm not going to tell you like when you start serving God, everything gets super easy. But there are certain things that I did that I am going to share with you. And I'm going to share four points with you tonight that I think will help you that have absolutely transformed. And these are things that I live by that have helped me make it through it. Now, I can tell you some hilarious stories. Like I had those abandonment issues. So like when my ex-husband and I would get in these massive fights, um, I don't know if y'all probably ever fight, but when we get in some fights, John, here I am pastoring. And like, I'll never forget, I'd freak out if you would, especially if it'd be raining or thundering or something, because that's how it was the night my dad died. And um, if you started to leave or walk out on me, I mean, I would, I just literally go ballistic and think Mm. like, I would feel that fear, like that five-year-old little abandoned girl. And one day, um, Randy, you know, I don't know what we were inviting about, something stupid probably. And I jump in front here, Pastor Paula. I mean, we've had a church probably 10,000 at the time in Tampa, Florida. And I jump in front of the door and I'm, I'm trying to block him from leaving, right? And he gets in the car. So I run and I jump in the car and he looks and he's like, don't say words, you better shut up. And I, I know most pastors aren't supposed to confess all this stuff, right? I'm supposed to say, praise the Lord. Like we just prayed all the time and fasted, mm-hmm. but this is real life guys and, and how you make it through some difficult times. And I, you know, how long does that work for a woman who's hurting? So I tried to be real submissive and quiet and everything for a whole one, two minutes. And then I just start yapping. Right. And he, he goes, get out. And I'm, I'm looking, he's going, get out of the car. So I get out of the car and we're front in front. We are on Del Mabry road, which is a main road in Tampa, Florida. And we are in South Tampa, and it's just this main room. We're in front of a Boston market. I'll never go to Boston market again. I don't think I've ever been. (laughs) And he starts to pull off, and I jump on the hood of the car. Here I am, Pastor Paula, jumping on the hood of the car like, don't leave me. And he so he just starts doing the windshield wipers. And that day I get off and I go, God, I've got issues. I need Mm. help. You know, and I really was like, I really... I really need some serious transformation in my life. And I just did nothing. And when I say that, it's because what I do, no matter what, no matter, I have spent more time in the presence of God than Mm. in the time of anyone else. Mm. I had the way this Bible is torn up and morphed into is, uh, I've probably got about 15 of them like this that are just ripped up, torn up. Not because I like to rip up Bibles, because this is my lifeline. This is my navigation. This is truth. So I had no idea. I couldn't discern a good man if one came and, you know, hit me upside the head. I would have just, I wouldn't have been able to know. I didn't know what family looked like. I didn't know what does a wife look like? What's a mother look like? What does, I had no backdrop to be Mm. whole, to be functional in life. So my backdrop became the word of God. And I found out that so much, you know, I felt shame for my past. I felt embarrassment. I felt guilt. Um, I felt low self-esteem. Um, you know, I had my issues. Uh, I was a good girl in many ways, but it was out of rebellion. I was not going to be like my mom. So I was not going to do drugs or be a raging alcoholic. Uh, so I had other control issues, anorexia, bulimia, which are all still the same, control. I wanted to control life. And it wasn't, it took me years and years and still working on complete surrender to the Lord. But I'm telling you, this is your lifeline right here. And if you will every day ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you, he'll show you who you really are. Remember when Jesus went into the wilderness, um, you know, we all go, well, he's Jesus. Okay. He's fully God, but he's fully man. He's tempted in every way we are. So he's God incarnate. He's divinity wrapped in humanity. So when, he, when the, the dove descends, and this is the real battle all of us will have, the dove descends, and 
you know, Peter's there, a few of the disciples are there, and John the Baptist there, he's just been baptized, right? I'm sorry, but disciples aren't there, he's just been baptized. John the Baptist is there, baptized him, goes down, heavens open up, and God says, this is my son. He gives his identity, whom I am well pleased in. The next thing is he's led into the wilderness where he's tempted for 40 days. Now everybody will say, well, he's tempted over, and we can all say different things. He's tempted about, um, you know, if, over his power, over, you know, giving angels charge of everything. So there are three things. They said, if you be the son of God, and there really wasn't three different temptations. It was always the same. Watch mm -hmm. what the word says. If thou be the son of God, then speak to these stones and turn them into bread. If thou be the son of God, jump off the, this pinnacle and give your angels charge of thee. If thou be the son of God, then look, here I am, Satan. Satan's tempting him. Here are all my kingdoms. I'll give them all to you. All this will be yours. So what the challenge was, was do you know who you are? Right. Do you know who you are? And every time he came back, and what did he say? It is written. It yes. is written. Yes. It is written. So the battle in a nutshell for all of us is going to be, do you know who you are? That's good. And the way to overcome that is to always go, it is written. And I can't tell you the day, but remember that story when my mom goes, God, why'd you give me such a beautiful boy and such an ugly little girl? So I believed I was ugly. I believed that I was, I was ugly inside, ugly outside. And I created behavior that, that attracted to me really some not so good situations some broken situations but the more i got into it is written it is written it is written and the more i begin to speak that over myself and one day the lord said to me he said okay paul i want you to take every part of yourself and and declare how you are fearfully and wonderfully created according to psalm 139 so I did. It says that we're fearfully and wonderfully creating the image of God. So I started with my hands because my mom said, you have beautiful hands. They're like your dad's. The only thing I could remember her saying about me. And I said, God, I thank you for these hands. You made them. They're so beautiful. God, I thank you for them. Then I went to my wrist and I got to my elbows. And this sounds silly, but I, this is how I started. And I was like, man, God, these elbows, they're so sexy. They'd make a man lust. I'm just kidding. All right, guys. All right. I was like, <laughs> I'm like, all right, Lord, I just thank you. And it was a two-year process looking back. And I can't tell you when, but there was a day I looked in the mirror and I didn't hate myself anymore. Mm. And Ezekiel chapter 16 talks about the baby girl who wasn't handled properly. She wasn't salted. She wasn't swaddled. She wasn't washed. So she loathed the day she was born. Then it says, God covered her with his feathers. And that's what God will do. He'll cover you with his word. He'll cover you with his presence. And so the more I got into his word, the more I began to understand that, that his word was truth. His word was power. His word is infallible. His word is flawless. I didn't understand it all at first. You know, I got lost down there in Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, you know, Deuteronomy. And I still, so I'd stay in Psalms and Matthew, Mark, John, but I'd have someone help me. But this is what I did. I started praying, Holy Spirit, give me revelation. Now, these are the four things I want to talk to you about as I, I do this, because these are some things that really help me and continue to help me overcome. See, when you begin to pray for revelation, it's a, it's a extraordinary, I wrote some things down for you. Revelation is deeper than knowledge. It's a special, extraordinary manifestation uh, that comes from God that removes every veil. Because in life, that's what the enemy does. He veils us. So Ephesians 1, 17 and 18 says that the eyes of your understanding might be in line, that you may know what is the hope of the riches of your glory, the inheritance of the saints. So what God has given me and what he'll give all of us is a vision. Now that's important because remember Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, this is the first thing I want you to get. You have to know that you are not just here by accident. You are sent here with a purpose, meaning there's an intention. You are a person of purpose, which means before you ever arrived, your entire life has been laid out. Mm. Now, I bind myself to the will of God every single day because doing that, I know that I'll walk more in God's plan. The will of God comes to pass by prayer. That's the vehicle that brings it to pass. So I pray that I walk out his will 
because you are a person of purpose. Remember John 10.10, 10, that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I can teach you a lot about what steal, kill, and destroy, but let's just go to that word destroy. It means to utterly abolish your purpose. What the enemy wants is more than just you. He wants what you carry because what you carry is the intention of God. You carry greatness. No matter where you've been, what you've done, how many times, who it's been with. People, listen, they've written all kinds of stuff about me. You know, they kick me to the curb all the time still. You know, some people are like, she's great. Some people are like, she's Satan. Some people are, you're never as good as they say you are. You're never as bad as they say you are. You're who God says you are. Right. And so you've got to be able to hear God's voice. And when you hear God's voice through revelation, you have to get a vision. This is really important because vision, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 says, where there's no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law or the word, happy is he. So vision in the Hebrew is a word that's called quasom. It's sight. Mentally, it means dream, revelation, or oracle. It's from the root of quasi, which means to gaze at, which you're continually staring at. Mentally, to perceive, to contemplate. It means to have a vision, to behold, to prophesy. And prophesy isn't just like foretelling. It's to tell forth. It means to be able to shift things in your life. So the Webster says that vision is the act or power of seeing something supposedly seen, a mental image, the ability to foresee or perceive something not actually visible as through a mental acuteness. So we could say this, that vision is a mental picture of my future that is absolutely forceful enough to mold my present. So mm -hmm. when I was living in that trailer, that they called me trailer trash. I knew that God was in the recycling business. <laughs> God saw me as treasure, but I had to continue to speak treasure over my life, words over my life, scriptures over my life until I believed what God said about me. So you've got to get a vision, a vision that you understand you're a person of purpose and what the enemy's after is your purpose. The date between the, the dash between the two dates is the most important. And that's what we do for God. That's what lasts. And you'd say, well, my situation doesn't allow me to. My circumstance does. Of course, God knew everything you would do, everywhere you would be, and he still has a great purpose for you right now. So what the enemy will fight you over, if he doesn't mind, honestly, you going to heaven, you getting saved. He just hates you taking people with him. He hates when you start fulfilling the purpose because the ultimate is the mission. Jesus came to redeem us, to purchase us back, to have a relationship with God. But his main message was thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The kingdom of God is at hand. So the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God. So remember how God works without getting too technical here. That it is illegal for God to do anything in the earth unless he partners with someone. So God's always looking to and from, for in the earth, looking for someone who will sell out to him, looking for someone who will yield and say yes to him. So when God said, let man have dominion, he legally transferred dominion over to man. So that's why you are co-laborers with Christ. So if God wants to move, the problems that we're facing in our nation and stuff right now is it's not a world problem. That's not, the world's going to always be this world. We're in this world. We're not of this world, but we're sent to this world. It's a church problem. And people don't want to hear that, but the church is the only legal authorized entity in the earth that has the ability to bring forth true transformation. Because God is different with those who he is in covenant with. So when God has a covenant with you and you begin to understand that, you get a vision. So the mental picture of my future that was forceful enough to mold my present was greater than anything I've ever been. So my spirit, so when it talks about um, all New Testament blessings come out of what a word called illumination. When you're illuminated, it comes out of revelation. And that word means like a Kodak picture on the inside of you. So your spirit has a memory of your future that your mind struggles to comprehend. So you might be in a situation like, take it when I was, you know, living in my trailer or whatever. Take it when I could give you a lot worse scenarios for me. But um, 
some of them just read the book. I tell most of it. All right. Um, but it, it could be a bad situation that I was in, but I got a mental picture that, that was forceful enough to mold my future. I stayed in the word of God. So if I continue to read that, the, the key there with vision is having spiritual eyes to see. Now, John, cut me off at any time and try to get us into some things because um, it's so important that you really understand that the word becomes the filter for your life because all revelation, like I said, comes from this Greek word of photograph and it's God putting a picture on the inside. So revelation is a result of God communicating to my mind mm. through word. So there are three kinds of people, natural, they're not born again, have no relationship with God, carnal, which means they have a relationship with God, but they're led by their five senses. What I see, what I hear, what I speak, what I smell, what I feel. That's sensory perception. Then there's spiritual people. That means your mind and your heart is connected and controlled by the Holy Spirit. So when you are a person that begins to walk in revelation, and this is key to changing your situation. When you begin to walk by revelation, it's a result of God communicating with my mind through faith in his word. Now, faith is belief, peace, it's a whole other thing, and faith takes created attention for it to function. But what happens is this creates the realm of all things possible. So revelation creates perception, which is the capacity for you to have comprehension to realize the possibility for change. Mm. So the only reason, the only way something changes in your life. So I look back like, and look and say, the generational curses are broken. My son did not go through all the struggles that I went through. Now he still went through a struggle. He was an atheist. Um, you know, he has <laughs> a big anarchist tattoo on his back. He was an addict. He went through his struggles, but he had a praying mom. And I didn't get everything right in the beginning, but I never gave up on God. And I never gave up on what God kept showing me and going from glory to glory. And he'd make fun of me taking those anointed prayer cloths and putting them in his, you know, Converse tennis shoes and his jeans. He's like, you're crazy. You know, he thought I had daddy issues. But then one day God radically saved. And I'm not, and my son's extremely educated. He's got it. He's got philosophy major, performing arts. I don't know how all this goes together. Theology. He's a pastor today. He's 34 years old. He's an extreme uh, conservative, which is like a salt of Paul situation. Um, he kept his tattoo just as part of his, his, his testimony to where God brought him from. Mm. Totally free. I mean, from his addictions, anger. He was abused. I mean, there were a lot of different things that, that happened in his life. And, and I'd say that today, even though my story was much worse than the things that I went through, his was better. But guess what? I have two beautiful grandchildren. He's been married nine years now. Brad was the first person to graduate college, the first person not to have a shotgun wedding, <laughs> the first person not to get pregnant out of wedlock. The first person, he's been married nine years now, all right? They've had some of their stuff. Was, that's, this is a miracle for my family, all right? The first person not to get divorced under a couple years. The first person not to get in trouble with the law and everything else. <laughs> so now I've got two grandchildren. It's going to be even better for them. Mm -hmm. We're turning that thing around from generational cursing to generational blessing. And I say all my family members are now saved. Now, some I'm barely, but they're saved, right? <laughs> and I keep praying and I keep pressing in. So what I'm telling you is that you really, your perceptions then begin to determine your conception. Because remember, perception comes out of revelation, what you perceive, how you see the world. Perception becomes more powerful than reality. All behavior comes out of belief. So when we get faulty belief, and it's called ABCs. A, an action happens in our life that creates a belief that starts a behavior that creates a consequence. So when that happens and it's faulty, that becomes our reality. But God says that's not your reality. Revelation in the word is your reality. So my perceptions then determine my conceptions, what I'm going to conceive in life. 
So when my mind is spiritual, one that's connected and controlled by the Holy Spirit, and my soul gets washed by the word of God, it not only includes conception or creation of an idea, but causes me then to act on it according to what's being produced in my spirit. So John, you could never have this ministry and do what you do if God didn't show you something on the inside before it was ever seen on the outside. So here we all are tonight. Here we are in our huddle because you didn't just see it internally. You acted on it. You believed it. Now you don't get there by yourself. And these are some of the things that I want to show to you about some fundamentals, because when you get that, that uh, revelation, remember what the enemy's really after is your faith. So when Peter uh, goes back to the familiar, right, when he gets disappointed because they all thought that, that Jesus was going to set up an earthly kingdom and overthrow the Roman government, et cetera, and it doesn't go down that way. He's crucified on a cross. He goes to the whipping post of flagrum. And they, they, they want him to wear a crown, but nobody wears a crown without picking up a crown. So he's buried in a borrowed tomb, rises again on the third day. And then Peter, it's like, I'll never deny you. I'll never deny you. What's he do? Cuss him out three times. I never knew him, da, 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 all this stuff. And he feels guilt. He feels shame. He feels bad about him. But what does God say? What does Jesus say to him before? In Luke chapter 22, he says, Simon, Simon. Now, his name is Simon Peter. But anytime God speaks to you twice, it's out of covenant. So what God was saying is, I have a covenant with you even when you're going to mess up. I have a covenant with you even when you're going to be flaky. And so Simon means uh, like flesh, flaky. But Peter means Petra, rock, solid. So he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired you. This is important. To sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail you not. So it's an interesting word because to sift you as wheat means to agitate you to the overthrowing of your faith. So Satan has desired to agitate you to the overthrowing of your faith. You can put that in for every one of us. We're always going to experience that. But I have prayed for you. You have a high priest that's praying for you right now that your faith fail you not. What he's saying is we're going to fail at times. But if you hold on to the faith, the word of God, it will not fail you in life. And when you are looking around confused and things are like, they're not making sense because you have radical disorientations and things don't always turn out right because God's sovereign plan is bigger. And sometimes we see in part and God sees bigger than we do. You keep holding on. You don't quit. Never quit. Don't you ever quit on God because God will never quit on you. And so faith is a substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen. The message version says the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. Ancestors set them above the um, crowd. So there are four things I want to give you real quick um, that when you get a vision, how you implement it. And what you do with that. So I had 67 pages. I'm only, and I only got to page two, John. So you've got to have me back in the huddle sometime. <laughs> you ready? Number one, here's your strategy steps, right? Habakkuk chapter two, verse two and three. This is the message version. It says, and then God answered, write this, write what you see, write it out in big block letters so that it can be read on the run. The vision message is a witness pointing to what's coming. It aches for the coming. It can hardly wait, and it doesn't lie. If it seems slow in coming, wait. It's on its way. It mm. will come right on time. So it's important that you keep your vision. Remember, vision from God's perspective comes out of revelation, which is through the reading of his word, which gets into your spirit, and it is a mental picture because your spirit then gets into your mind, right? and begins to transform that mind and change it, taking out the old, putting in the new. And what begins to happen there with the renovation, the process of being changed, is it's a mental picture of your future mm. based out of revelation that is forceful enough to mold your present. So what you start acting like is you act different right now. Even though your situation hasn't changed, you start changing. And then the next thing you know, Things start changing and the whole world starts lining up with that revelation and that vision that's on the inside of you. And that's the supernatural part.
Because if you would have said to me 30 years ago, you're going to be serving at the White House over, you know, the Faith Opportunity Initiative, I'd been like, yeah, right, what you smoking, you know, like, I didn't know how I was going to get out of my trailer in Mount Airy, Maryland. I didn't know how I would get out of an abused victim mentality. I didn't know how I'd get out of self-loathing and low self-esteem. I didn't know how I'd get out of poverty. I didn't know how I'd get out of all these things, you know, but God and God, I think it's important. I shared my story with you because people like look at certain aspects of your life and think like they go, that's the glory. And, and I'm proud of a lot of my accomplishments. Um, won the trumpet award, even Jesse Jackson's given me two rainbow coalition, even Al Sharpton. Come on guys. I mean, my <laughs> on the balcony with Martin Luther King's 40th anniversary, um, MBA, uh, behind the scenes wife's award, um, have done Bible study for the New York Yankees. I preach in almost so many prisons, every prison, every, uh, every prison in Florida, Texas. Uh, we've done so much um, over the years. I mean, we, we in this last, in the, since COVID, we've, we have fed 1.6 million pounds of food, just wow. our community, 1.6 million. And, I, and that's just through our ministry. And I'm working with this coalition that we've put together for Farmers to Family. It's done 20 million boxes over this nation. So I'm really proud of the accomplishments and think it all started with giving a turkey away. Yeah. Like I had a picture that God could actually use my life to do something great. I preached the gospel in 120 countries. I mean, it's, it's pretty astounding, but I'm, I'm married to the best man in the world. I met him <laughs> on the Southwest. So, you know, when all you single ladies fly Southwest, when it's back up, <laughs> so uh, you never know what God will do. I'm telling you, don't <laughs> stop believing. And, um, but here's what I want you to do. Once you get that revelation, I want you to write the vision. So get an action plan or mission statement. You need a personal mission statement for your life and for your purpose. Number two, you make it plain. Clearly define your goals and objectives. I'll give you a couple thoughts on these. Number three, it says that he may run. Develop a team. You don't succeed alone. And that's where I actually talk about the huddle, and I'll probably just go there. And that he may run, that read it, that you've got to implement it. So your vision statement, I'll give them to you real quick. You must develop a statement of your purpose. Who are you? What are you? Why are you? Without answering these questions, you spend a lifetime wondering. So it's your supreme reason for existence. And um, contrary to popular belief, your purpose is not your job. Your purpose is not necessarily just what you do. Your, it is your supreme reason for existence. We all were sent into this earth because your daily life will be a living reflection of your life purpose. And then you are an image bearer of God. Number two, make it plain. Clearly define those objectives and goals. Luke 19, 10, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Like he came to put back in position that which had been mispositioned. Mm. Clear definition. Um, it goes on and give you scripture after scripture. But goals are simply bite-sized pieces of your vision that can be measured and attained. It's a step-by-step -step process. Nobody succeeds overnight. A process is an inevitable series of events that you're going to go through because God's going to be forming you and molding you and making you. Mm. Um, and if you get to do that behind the scenes, give God praise. I had to live a lot of my life out in the public, and that's really hard. It's just genuinely like you're on full display, but that was God's, that was God's choosing for my life. And so... Um, when you do that, you make it plain, you clearly define, because without a vision, people first, they buy into the visionary, okay? And then you've got to be able to make the vision very plain. Like my life, I exist for two primary reasons, to bring spiritual truths that transform lives, that's to preach the gospel. It's my number one reason for existence, why I have Paula White Ministry, any church I've pastored, why I do what I do. I've known the president for 19 years. And I serve him as an assignment from God because God spoke to me 19 years ago when he called me out of the blue and God told me, show him who I am. So mm. it was an assignment from God. And, and cause you know, like I, I'm not personally, like I'm not into politics. That's not my thing. I'm into Jesus, but I have an assignment in an arena right now that I stay in my lane within that assignment. Mm. So you 
know what your assignment is. John, you know your assignment. So whatever that is, make sure that you do that. Then number three, that he may run. You have to develop a team because you'll never be able to run in life if you don't have a team. No one succeeds alone. And I'm almost through. People often cast a vision to others expecting the dream to work and failing to recognize that the vision needs support. You need support. The enemy always does the same thing. Isolate, divide, conquer. So sometimes you get frustrated trying to force feed people um, who are not hungry for what's in you. My mentor taught me a long time ago, Paula, if you set the table out and people aren't eating your food, then you're just got, you're in the wrong place. Just shift your table because you'll find who's mm. hungry for yeah. what you've got to serve. And there's a people that are hungry for what's on the inside of you, hungry for what your passion and your purpose is. All you have to do, nothing's wrong with your food. It's just some people don't have an appetite for find the people who have an appetite. Then you find who you're connected. You've got to find your tribe. So it's very important because you've got to be around people who are like spirited. You've got to have people that aren't just yes men. Um, I'll show you something real quick. Can you take one second, John, and I'll be through. Like This was my lifesaver. Um, I invested in myself after my divorce and a lot of mess up. I spent a lot of money. I've gone to a lot of therapy and counselors, and I put um, spiritual coaches and spiritual mentors in my life. And this is called Paula White Life Plan. I don't show too many people this, so you guys get to really see it. They take my life for weeks and months and they map it out. Everything that you've ever done, every memory you ever have of your life. And in a nutshell, this is funny. Um, here is my life on a piece of paper right here. Mm. <laughs> this is my whole life on a piece of paper. So what they do is they go like this. I'll show you like, um, like they start with life renewal and I'll help you. What must change? Where am I? And this is what my mentors taught me. Life management. How am I doing? Where am I heading? Um, then they take, and this is what they do to show you after all this, this is my whole life right here. Mm. And it'll go through, like you'll see here, stuff like turning points. It says here, themes, life domains, personal, family, professional, community, daddy's little girl years, the chaos years, awkward, unhealthy stabilization, true identity established years, foundation years. This means I have a life gate here. Now, most people will have one. I've had three. So when I had this done, they knew that there were things that could derail me in my life. Now, these mentors are still in my life. So let me tell you how important when I say I'm married to John, like how important I'm going to bring you to this. So they go into what is right, what is wrong, what is confused, what is missing, right? Here's all the turning points in my life. They go, dad is a caretaker, dad's death, abuse begins, punished for wedding, mom remarries, gymnastics, moved to uh, Danville, California, liberal living, uh, saved, having bread. So you can see all the different like major turning points in my life. All this turning point lessons, like I'm caretaker, I must be careful not to take on a God complex, I'm a restorer, I'm a gatherer. So they do all that to figure out what my talents are. Restore, I love to see people restored out of their pain. Communicator, you can see that by how long I'm going. I love to dialogue about life story and truth. Reproducer, I yearn for spiritual sons and daughters. Transformer, I'm driven to see life transformation. Reconciler. I love bringing opposing forces together. This book, John, was done in 2010. Think about what I'm doing 10 years later, all right? Passions, needs, drives, obsessions. Here's what my life ends up being. Here's where it says heart. What can I, what do I care about? I care about real change in people. What do I dream about? To spearhead spirituality that makes a difference. What's my opus gloria or contribution to bring real transformation through muddy authenticity? So let's just go over to one thing. I show what kind of leader I am, my life replenishment, my core values. Now here's where it is, my life strategy. Risk pyramid. Number one thing at the top was my ex-husband at the time. Some things that I was shackled to with some debt, professional support system, wrong guy in my life, and I was a workaholic. So they said that three things could topple me. My life purpose was a life transformer. 
My life vision was ongoing transformation. My life mission, optimize 10 year strategic window, be freed from, and told me what to do to keep writing, gave me a life plan. So here it is, my story, my talents, my heart, my thinking. So what they do is they go, one red is dead, which means like if I go to do anything in my life, it has to meet all this. So what did they say? My life wins. Um, and I'm going to show you where it's important for your team. So what I had to do, okay, these were the things that would, these are my life things. Let me get to my mentorship. Okay, life accountability, life plan partner. Bishop Jakes has been my spiritual father, Archbishop Duncan Williams. These are people that were spiritual sons and daughters. This is my life net, okay? My whole strategies. Marion Hurd was a great mentor to me, has been my lifeline friends. So those are my mentors, right? So when it went to the number one thing that could topple me that they identified, and it started with the death of my father, was the wrong man. So when mm -hmm. I met John, guess what happened? Poor John. <laughs> Here's this guy. He goes, I'm never going to Africa. He goes, I don't belong in Africa. He's been like nine times now because Archbishop Duncan Williams there. He was my main mentor in, in spiritual accountability. But John went and met him first in London. We got married in Ghana on Prayer Mountain. He went to Ghana. He met with my board. He met with Bishop Jakes. He met with my mom. He met with my children. Why? Because even after 30 something years, I realized that I had the propensity to still pick the wrong guy. Mm. So I had a life net that I had in my life. So before I went in and I fulfilled this assignment to work alongside and do the faith opportunity initiative, my life network, my board, my mentors, now my husband still goes. I go, do I do this? Like, this is what God's saying. Any decision in my life, remember what we say is one red is dead. So I have a life book that this isn't just something that I talk about. I implement. I pray that you've gotten something out of this because this is how I live my life. It starts with revelation, a vision, but then there's got to be implementation. And that implementation, one of the keys to keeping yourself truly to staying on track is having that life net plan, which who is your net? Who's your net in life? I pray I've been a blessing. Oh my goodness. Would you guys give her a big gigantic hand? Pastor Paula, I promise you, uh, it, it certainly has been a blessing. I know that I'm personally just full. Uh, you know, you walk away just on full. And uh, you, know, you, you have to, have to, have to, uh, have to come back. Um, and and we're we'll running a little bit of short on time, but I want to go to a couple of uh, uh, comments that anybody might have. I want to first start up inside Casa Grande. Uh, Michael Russell, if you're listening in there, and then Pastor Paula, uh, you know, we just, I'm going to ask if you would just pray us out before we go. So, Michael, uh, does anybody in Casa Grande have any questions, comments uh, on some of the things that uh, Pastor Paula had said? Man, that was absolutely amazing. I know Art is controlling the, uh, the mute buttons. We only probably have time for a couple uh, of questions, but Pastor Paula, that was just so amazing. Thank so you. Amazing. Thank you, John. All right. John, it's Nicole Tangway over at Casa Grande. Hey, Nicole, how are you? Hi, Pastor Paula. Hey, Nicole. Hi, I just want to say, first of all, that you're a huge inspiration, I know, to me and to all of us here. And thank you so much for sharing your story and giving us the four steps um, that you we should live by. And um, I just want to say, like, really quick that um, I know for me, I have a, a similar, uh, you know, revelation uh, story where I uh, was sitting in my jail cell and I remember crying out to God, like, how did this happen? Why did this happen? How did I end up here? And just give me a revelation. Why am I supposed to be here? And he clearly showed me a whole timeline of things that were going to happen. And I just started journaling and writing it all down. And I get chills as I even talk about this. Because as you're telling your story, I'm like, check, check, check. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, this is, this happened to me too. And so here I am five years later. And my whole life has changed completely. And yeah. everything that he said was going to happen, even coming to Casa Grande four years early, working with, you know, inside with the Department of Corrections, being able to do these things that people don't normally get to do in prison. And I was able to get that because the plan he has for me afterwards, you know what I mean? And so I could just That's see awesome. your, 
and matches mine and it, it just gives me like hope that you know I, I am on the right track with God and, and everything's gonna work out great. So thank you for your story. <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> Amen, Nicole. It's so exciting. That's a word. We're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word yes. of our testimony, which yes. is the evidence yes. of God in our life. Right. Proud of you. Yes. So proud yes. of you. All right, outstanding. We great time for one more prayer. Ask Pastor Paul that you uh, pray us out. Oh <clears throat> my goodness, I am so full right now. Amen. <clears throat> Are we ready to for pray or right. one more question? All right, we had another question comment before we pray. I don't see anything in the All comment. Right. <clears throat> well, that is that is good. Um, Pastor Paul, would you please take us up top? I'd love to. Father, mm. we just come to you right now, and I'm so grateful for everyone on this line, and I just pray right now that you would wrap your arms of love around them, extend your hand, the right power of your hand and arm around them right now. I ask that you would give them revelation, let every generational curse be broken off of them, that no weapon formed against them will be able to prosper. Satan, we declare that the blood of Jesus is against you, and anything that you would bring to torment them, to lie to them in any way, we block it, for God is love. So let everything that is not of love be uprooted right now let anything that needs to be transformed in our life we we yield ourselves to you and holy spirit i ask for divine visitations that you are ordering our steps and you are orchestrating our path and i ask that everyone on here you would raise them up as great lights and set them upon a hill that cannot be hid that you would use them as the salt of this earth that as they yield themselves greater and greater to you god that you would show them your glory show them your goodness show them your favor god let them increase in wisdom let them increase in knowledge let them increase in in the knowing of who you are and we just break and bind every demonic plan of wickedness against them and we just thank you right now for freedom for who the sun sets free is free indeed i pray over their families i pray over their purpose i secure their destiny i secure their purpose i secure their families right now we pray over their lost loved ones that they would come to know jesus christ as lord and savior and that you would draw them deeper God and that the right people would come into their lives Lord let anyone that is not of you be exposed let them be exposed God and I just pray that you would bring in mentors truly people that are full of wisdom full of insight full of discernment full of discretion full of your spirit and full of your love surround them and give them a hedge and give them favor like they've never known for favor starts with the fear of the Lord which is the reverence of God so we thank you that as we come into intimacy with you then lord you begin to do an, a work that is just so inexplicable and unexplainable mm -hmm. in our life in jesus name and bless john bless <laughs> keep him lord keep him we put a hedge of fire around him a wall of fire around him we post angels around him and his family right now and we declare that whatever words would ever be spoken any demonic networks any um any jezebel spirit or witchcraft mm -hmm. that would try to operate against him or his family or his purpose that it would be broken by the superior blood of Jesus in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Paul, that was just absolutely uh, amazing. Man, thank you so much for sharing and your, your complete transparency. I know that in that transparency of you sharing tonight, I know that there was many eyes that were open, right? And many chains that have fallen off. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Love you two thank pieces. You. Make you. sure make sure you tell Jonathan we said thank you for carving I out will. some time. <laughs> I will. Next time we'll have a meeting and don't stop believing. We got a new puppy, so he's out there babysitting right now. Right. <laughs> All right. So the well, carpet didn't get tore up. All right. Love you guys. Yes. Love you Be too. Blessed. Thank you, Pastor Paula. Be blessed, All right. guys. All right. Bless you.